I just want to start off with big congrats on I think you just hit forty thousand followers on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, just the other just the other day. Oh no, last night I think it happened. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's sort of seen a bit of a bit of a surge in the last week, thanks yeah. to a video and then yeah, forty thousand pretty crazy man there's so much stuff i want to ask you about youtube and i think like a lot of architects are kind of curious about youtube video more generally so i feel like you're you're the guy to talk to about it but maybe tell a little bit of the story of kind of where the youtube account kind of came from and the journey that it's been on so far um just to give a bit of a sense of for people who haven't been watching design and motive youtube just like explode recently like where did it kind of begin and yeah what's been happening over the last year or so yeah, so I would say that the YouTube journey started back probably in 2015 or 2016. I, like probably millions of others, um, became a bit of a Casey Neistat fanboy when he started his daily vlogs on YouTube. Um, and that got me really interested in uh, video. And so, I mean, if you did a deep enough dive, you would see all these multiple YouTube channels I made over the course of the last five years where it's sort of, you know, um, you know, I went to Japan in 2016 and I made a few videos around that, just like vlog style videos. Um, and then, you know, same with when I went to India and Uluru and stuff like that. So that really got me interested in video creation. Yeah. And then it was kind of like, okay, my interest is in architecture. Um, how can I, perhaps bring video into architecture, which at the time, and even now it's still, it was pretty fresh, pretty brand new, hasn't really been explored, yeah. um, especially in like the YouTube context. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of architecture documentaries and TV shows, you know, the, in, you know, grand designs, and then you've got architecture, like no, not architecture, but you know, the block and all these home renovation shows and all that, but that's yeah. for a TV context. Um, so how could architecture live on a YouTube channel, which has its own little context? Um, and so when I left a company I was working with um, and I decided to go out on my own and pursue my own architecture media career yeah. from time, it sort of gave me the opportunity to pursue that video side of architecture. So mm. I guess for me, especially in the beginning, it was really tricky to get started because you'd email an architect and go, <clears throat> you know, I want to make a, I want to make a video about, you know, this house you've designed. Yeah. And then great. What will it, what will it look like? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what it would look like. I don't even know how, how much, how long it would take, how much views it would get or anything like that. It was completely in the dark. And thankfully I had a few willing participants in the beginning, yeah. um, Fumen Architects, um, DKO Architecture, Manny Architecture. Um, and that gave me a good opportunity to sort of explore how I might want to create the videos, have them look, sound, um, and sort of this, and, and start to learn how to tell the story through video format as opposed to the very typical um, write write an article type of thing. Yeah, it was. Um, and you know, and over over the like, so I did that. I started back in twenty eight. Oh, hang on, what are we? 2020, 2019. Yeah. Um, you know, I made a few made a few videos, sort of, and it was quite sporadic. Like I don't even know. I think I uploaded one in May and then one in June or July and, you know, like, yeah, you know, there wasn't really every couple of months sort of thing, every couple of months sort of, you know, whenever I could just get my hands on a project. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just over time, the videos just started to gain a bit more, not traction, but a bit more experience. So things I would learn for a previous shoot, I would bring into the next shoot. Um, yeah. And, and then, yeah, I think, I think it was like, the, the last couple of days in July in 2020, the, I think it was literally as we went into lockdown Yeah, here in Melbourne. The, for some reason, one of my videos just went absolutely bonkers. And then the YouTube channel kind of exploded from there. Like when yeah. you see the graph from inception in 20, at the start of 2019 to 
now there's like flat, 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 and then boom, 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 boom. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I want to talk about that video quite a bit. And I'm kind of thinking maybe we sort of, sort of deal with that as a separate thing, but we're there anyway. Like I think that the difference in your account, I mean, how many subscribers were you at before? So you're at basically 40,000 subscribers now on the Design Motive channel, almost 2 million views on the account overall. Crazy. What, what were those numbers before you dropped that? winter minimalist house video the one that really just i think it's 800 something thousand views now it just it just 100 x your nearest video really i mean but what was the growth in your account like when that video came through and how quickly did it happen after uploading it yeah so i uploaded that video towards the end of june so it took a month for it like i think in the first month it maybe got I mean, I could bring up my phone, but I don't want to That's be looking okay. at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it maybe did like 5,000 views in the first month. Yeah. And I was absolutely stoked. I'm like, <laughs> yes, this is doing great. That was a good video on your account at that point. You're like 5,000 views. That's doing well. Yeah. At the time, at that, in that at context, that it was yeah. doing well. Because I only had like 700 subscribers, I think. Yeah. Like, or maybe it was like 600. I was sort of getting close to 1,000 just before that video popped and I yeah. was like, oh, getting close to oh, that. Getting the big milestone. A thousand's a big milestone, right? Because you, yeah. you can start to actually make revenue on your YouTube account at that point, right? Yeah. So, you know, plus the 4,000 watch time hours yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But um, yeah, that 1,000 subscriber mark is sort of, you know, it's a milestone. It's a nice milestone. I, I even remembered celebrating when I got a thousand followers on Instagram back yeah. in the day. So yeah. A thousand's like, sweet. It's always People, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people are coming. People are people are sticking around, and yeah. then the one comma club. It's good. To yeah, <laughs> uh, one comma club. I like that. Um, yeah. So then it's just just like a month after for for no. Like you get all this sort of data in the YouTube studio yeah. that you know you got these browse. You can see that it came from browse or suggested video and stuff like that. But it's really hard to know why did YouTube start putting this in people's homepage a month after yeah like i'm not sure i still haven't really cracked it and i don't know why and i'm yeah. too scared to ask youtube directly because i don't think they'll answer anyway <laughs> they're not going to tell you <laughs> no they got to keep that algorithm under lock yeah um but for some reason yeah the algorithm picked it up and it just started showing it to a few people and yeah. then i started seeing this little spike and i was like oh hang on what's going on here because it's never it's never happened to me before yeah and i'm like okay, let's just see what happens. And then I think within the first day or two of it going viral, I, I call it viral because in my context, it, it was viral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, especially in architecture context, that was viral. In proportion to the like the size of your account prior to that oh, or, yeah. or your typical views, it went viral. Like for, yeah. for the level your account was at. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think in that within that couple of days, I ended up jumping to like 5,000 subscri- subscribers, um, it was sort of like at 50,000 views and stuff yeah. like it. Like there was a spike and yeah. I immediately applied to the YouTube partner program because I hit that threshold. Um, and I remember I applied and then within 24 hours, I was like approved, mm. which is crazy because it usually takes 30 minutes, uh, 30 days for that um, yeah. approval process to happen. But I don't know. They rushed, I guess they rushed pretty- you through. They were like, we have to partner this guy. He's too good. He's too good. Rising we've star. Get so, ex- yeah, we've got to get ads. Exactly. We've got to, we've got to get the ads on this. Yeah. Vlogging dishwashers and stuff on these on these videos. Um, so o- awesome. So okay, maybe maybe it's worthwhile for anybody that hasn't actually seen that video. Um, just in sort of a quick summary, that minimalist home video, the one that did really really well. Um, mm. Do you want to maybe just quickly break down? what the elements of that video were that you think made it successful. And I guess kind of just a little bit of a brief sort of um, summary of what that video was about. Yeah. So Winter Architecture, um, who have been a great collaborator with me, um, they designed this renovation, not an extension, just a renovation, um, just a renovation to a um, townhouse in South Yarra. Mm -hmm. It was, I looked at some of the before photos and it was, quite abysmal uh, just the color scheme the lack of lighting there was clutter the walls weren't straight 
just the layout was just horrendous. Um, yeah. So the, the client engaged them to obviously freshen it all up, strip it back, and then, you know, get the layout working properly for, for a family. And, you know, as a result, it was this quite white, minimalist looking home. And of course, they, on the same, I filmed it on the same day they did the photo shoot. Yeah. And here's something that a lot of people probably don't know about my videos, especially that video, is it was styled for a photo shoot. It wasn't necessarily how the client lived on a day to day basis, but, you know, it's just how it was styled yeah. in the photo shoot. Same with, same with everything in magazines and a lot of the blogs and Instagram accounts and all that. Like that's been styled for that shoot. Yeah. Um, but it did have a very minimalist aesthetic and at the time and, and still um, minimalism is quite a popular and trend, trending topic on mm. YouTube. Mm. Um, a lot of people have a lot of opinion of what is minimal, minimalist minimalism. Yep. <laughs> um, and so I think it was just through some keyword because it did pick up a few keywords in the, in the early days, um, minimalist house and minimalism, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it was really that that video was really just about not necessarily a minimalist house because I'm not technically, I don't know if the client calls themselves a minimalist, mm. um, but the style was very minimalistic. It was very, it was very pared back. It yeah. was very white. It was very clean, open. Um, and um, a lot of people resonated with that and a lot of people did not. Yeah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? That, I mean, anybody that's listening who looks up the video, go re go have a read of the comments after you've <laughs> um, finished watching it. It is an absolute mess down there in terms of people disagreeing with one another over whether or not they like the house and, yeah. or like the project. Well, do you think that that, I don't want to say divisiveness, but like, you know, it's something that it's hard to be on the fence about it. You either love it or you hate it kind of thing. There yeah. seems to be a bit of that going on with it, with the, maybe not even the project, but maybe just the way it's been captured in the video or the way it's styled, something about it um, is, is splitting people in one camp or the other. Do you think that that might have something to do with, you know, maybe part of what contributed to that takeoff of the video or is it just this? Oh, 100%. Like, 100%. Yeah. Whether they love it or hate it, um, that's her own personal opinion. Yep. Fair enough. But every time someone leaves a comment, yep. whether they yep. like it, whether it's a positive one or a negative one, the YouTube algorithm picks it up. It's engagement. And obviously that helps push it further and further. Yeah. People's um, home pages. And, you know, it's, I, it became, the comment section became very, it's not toxic, but it is, conf it's confusing for me as the yeah. content creator to, think about how do I moderate this? Yeah. Um, and do you listen to, the to point, them at all? <laughs> yeah. I, I, so many of them are giving you like, you know, notes on how you should be making your videos. Um, yeah. It's pretty No, crazy. like I, I, definitely, I definitely take on quite a bit of feedback in terms of like comments people leave, like, but then there are some comments they leave that is criticism, is constructive yeah. criticism yeah. and feedback that I won't take in because as the content creator, it's sort of my approach and my style. Of course, yeah. So, you know, if someone wants me to do a handheld walkthrough tour, then, you know, I'm not really going to do that because that's not my yeah, exactly. style. But if but if someone's like, oh, could you put the floor plan in, um, you know, I'll endeavour to do that, even though yeah. the last few years I haven't. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things where at some point you got to – read the comments, but then you've got to learn when to not pay attention to the comments. Yeah. But that must, that must be quite, um, quite an interesting challenge from, from, I remember, I remember thinking at the time, you know, this video is getting seen by so many people. If I was to put myself in, um, in winter architecture shoes, it's not common that architects actually see a comment section come alive on the internet. Mm. Um, critiquing or not critiquing but celebrating critiquing loving hating every spectrum of the rainbow yeah. of responses um yeah. where where else do you deal with that at the scale that it can potentially happen on youtube i was kind of thinking we was there ever a, was there ever any feeling of maybe we should 
turn these comments off for or something like in terms of the client or um, you might not be able to talk about it too much, but I'm just thinking maybe big picture, not about that specific project, but how, how do you handle, what's your thoughts on how do you handle the sensitivities around what happens once the video does get seen by a lot of people and we are just exposed to the comments of every, every stranger on the internet. How do you handle that in terms of the architect, the client, not just yourself? Hmm. That's, that's actually a really good question. Um, which I can use to reference Winter's video and Ben Callery's video, as yeah. that's recently crossed over 100,000 views and that's got yeah. quite a bit of comments. Um, so I have, I've decided to leave the comments section open, but if, if, you're, if you're being hateful mm. or, or using profanities or well, I guess some people have used profanities and I've kept it up. But if you're like in good taste, uh, <laughs> they've used yeah, profanity in good taste. It's, yeah. it's okay. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or if you're commenting on, you know, the architect's physical appearance, or you sort of, you know, if the comments just got a, if they're critiquing the person um, yeah. and all that, I will remove the comment. If it's, you know, especially hateful, I'll remove the comment. But if if you do, if I don't want to try to sense, not sense, I mean, censor on yeah. the internet is quite a hot topic at the moment, but like, I don't want to deprive anyone of of course, yeah, leaving their critique of a home, whether they call it a hospital or an insane asylum interior yeah. or whether they say, I absolutely love this home. Yeah. It's, I feel as though that's something we got to let people have a say yeah. to a certain degree. Um, I was talking to Jean from Winter on the way to a, other shoot I did with her yep. and we started talking about the comment section and at the end of the day the client was absolutely happy with the home she loved the home she loved what the work that winter architecture did yeah. and that validation is the only validation that winter architecture should be focused on not what's user 64 <laughs> wyv <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. You know, if the client loves loves it and, you know, colleagues love it and, you know, the, the local architecture community love it, then that's fantastic. Like, it, it, you're not going to please everyone with your buildings. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there is a point where you've got to disconnect yourself from that as the, both the content creator and publisher, but also the architect. And, you know, like, if, if Gene's happy and the client's happy, then that's all that really matters. And if other people love it, awesome. If other people don't love it, that's their prerogative. Um, yeah. On Ben's video, um, which I published last Sunday, very early on we had, I had someone leave a comment that I think they were arguing the semantics of the word that I used. Like in, you know, the video title is yeah. called, um, uh, an architect's home, uh, an, archi an architect's own sustainable timber home, or something like that. Something that throws in all the keywords. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a but, keyword. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. yeah, it's a keyword game. Yeah, um, but you know, someone someone picked up that in the video that Ben said that there's a bit of steel in the house to um, oh. obviously carry some of the spans, and they left a comment going, "Oh, this home's not sustainable. It uses steel. All the homes I've lived in use uses um, timber only, and blah 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 blah." And then I kind of left a comment replying back, sort of talking about the context of Australia and a lot of homes have concrete slabs and yeah, everything like that. And then they replied with this huge thing. That, essay. Like, essay that then let, which was just full of um, negativity and trying to prove a point. I wasn't quite sure what they were trying to prove. Yeah. And turns out they're in um, United States as well. Yeah. So the geological context was probably missed. Um, and then, you know, I sort of spoke to Ben on the phone about this and I was like, you know, how do you want to respond to him? Should we kind of go into more detail how it is sustainable and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and then Ben just wanted to, didn't want to get involved. And I'm like, fair enough, I'll, I'll go in and back <laughs> for you. I don't care. This is my channel. I do what I want. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we ended up just, well, I say we, me, I ended up sort of, given them another chance to explain their viewpoint and I left it up for 12 hours for them to respond mm. um, and they didn't. So I ended up just removing their comment because it wasn't really adding anything personally I felt to the conversation. It was just them wanting to 
push some narrative because I use the word sustainable in timber in the title of a video that yeah. also used a bit of steel. And they just went to town. They, I guess they just got triggered by that. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know whether what, a family member of theirs was crushed by a bit of steel or something. I don't know. But I ended up just removing that comment and then basically ever since then, all the comments on Ben's video has just been full of praise and love and yeah. you know, everyone loves the home, which is fair enough. It's a beautiful home. Yeah. But yeah. I guess the other, like I was also talking to Ben about it and I guess this also applies to Jean and um, every other video I put up is we tend to get focused on the one or two negatives comments and we forget about the 15, 20 positive comments full of love. We get yeah. fixated on that negative comment. So yeah, I guess the challenge there is at what point do you remove a comment? What point do you start to, I guess, restrict the comment section and, you know, turn off comments and stuff like that. And yeah, I guess Winter's video is sort of, I think I've deleted like 10 comments total from that video. Out so hundreds out of hundreds. So, and they were all just, yeah, just unnecessary comments that yeah, sure. didn't add to the conversation. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's the YouTube comment section is a very interesting place for yeah. sure. Do you think that it's a, uh, a kind of a, because obviously you've been spending a lot of time like on Instagram, um, sharing similar projects, the same projects, similar stories, similar mm -hmm. concepts, minimalism, sustainability, things that get people, you know, open for interpretation or everyone has their own sort of take on it. So they're going to jump in there and say like, no, this isn't sustainable or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that you get the same, YouTube just seems to take it up another notch, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I've never experienced a comment section like Winter's YouTube video. Yeah, ever on the on the Instagram account ever. Yeah, like there's been the occasional critique and negative comment, but there hasn't been like a single video, a single post that has just got yeah what that experienced. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that's I don't know whether that's got something to do with maybe because it's a youtube comment uh, a youtube video it's consumed to uh, post on an instagram instagram is quite a quite a scrolly social platform so it's easy enough for you to just scroll past you like you know you see you see a photo you don't like and you're like eh, and you just scroll past it whereas if you sit down on a youtube video and you watched i forget how long it is six minutes or whatever it may be yeah that, that gives you six minutes to think about what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. And then you're probably more inclined after consuming that piece of content to leave your comment, to leave your thoughts and feedback. Yeah. Feedback is used very loosely. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, let's jump into the, the sort of evolution of the videos a little bit, because you mentioned that early on, there was kind of a lot of experimentation and sort of wading through it and figuring out what was working. Mm. Do you think that you've gotten, gotten closer to understanding the kind of approaches to video that tend to produce better results for you on the account? No. It's like still a no. complete, still a mystery. So you're still experimenting quite a lot from video to video. Yeah. Well, like, I guess that's sort of a two part question because yeah. <clears throat> you can look at it in terms of the style of the building, but also the way that the video, the way that the video is created. Yeah. So I use quite a lot of tripod and locked off shots to sort of capture everything. I like to sort of approach it in terms of a, almost like compose a photo effectively, yep. but it's in a video and I kind of let things happen inside the frame. And, you know, I don't, I don't tend to use a lot of movement. I don't yep. tend to pan or tilt or anything like that. And that's sort of my approach to it. And it's sort of for me trying to figure out what angle what angles what um what shots of the kitchen i need what shots of the living room i need um external shots and whatnot um but then in terms of trying to figure out which projects will do well and which projects will you know get the views and get the likes and stuff like that that's still unknown to me um i mean as i'm sure anyone that runs a instagram account or or anything like that you kind of you kind of think you know how people are going to react to a video or, or a photo and then 
you know, it goes a complete opposite way. So um, for me, when I talk about the evolution of my experimentation, it's sort of trying to work out which shots I need to get. Also working on the audio quality of the videos, yes. um, the microphones and whatnot, um, especially if you've watched those first few um, <laughs> videos. Oh, I, re- I remember well, man, the scruffly, Absolutely. the scruffly wind noises and stuff. Oh, it was great. Absolutely dismal. You're too um, polished now, though, in the audio department. You've you've absolutely perfected it. So, congrats. Yeah. Man. So it's sort of you know it's sort of going through that and getting the right um, yeah lighting conditions and and um, sort of you know just kind of working through all those little logistical issues as well as sort of the processes of communicating with the architects yeah. and the amount of time you need on site and you know everything like that. So yeah, it's very. <laughs> Like, I don't know if I'm going to experiment too heavy in terms of style. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think I'm going to be bringing in Dolly. <laughs> yeah, no, of course not. Everything like that. But, you know, I might also experiment with different type of content around architecture and design, yeah. Um, yeah. different topics and themes and things like that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So the subject, will, the subject matter will change, but you're actually – you've got you've developed your own style for the construction of the video and then you're just working on refining it and making sort of subtle improvements mm. um, where you think you yeah, can. 100%, yeah. I, I think you just actually yeah. captured your account style or your video style really well where you're talking about these kind of locked off shots because i think there are a lot of architect well there aren't a lot of architecture accounts on youtube but there are some and they're doing and they do quite well but i watch them and i think that they remind me a lot more of what i normally see on tv or what you would mm. see like you know there's more of a comparison to those shows that you were mentioning earlier whereas i feel i feel like you've taken the approach of an architectural photographer who you know you you said you're trying to frame this picture but instead of taking a single exposure you're just kind of letting the video record for a while right and then mm. re, reposition go somewhere else take another space um, and your videos rely heavily on voiceover, right? And, and interviews yeah. and voice, and it's kind of this this pattern that you've developed. Uh, are you going to keep on, do you, you know, because not every video out there on architecture is has that format of an interview or, or an architect speaking and the voiceover, but is that something that you really like doing and are you going to keep doing that uh, as you go with your videos? Is it something that you think makes for a good, you know, you like it as a style? Yeah, despite what all the comments say. Too I much architect, keep... want to see more house. That's, that's... <laughs> Yeah, I am going to keep the architect in there yeah. so everyone can stop with that comment. Because yeah. that's what makes but... your account different from all the other, like from a lot of the others, right? And it's your style, it's your thing and yeah. Yeah, but I think what's really important, at least in my thinking, is who's the best person to communicate this project? Me, some architecture graduate yeah. with a camera, or the actual architect that spent one, two plus years on this project, they know all the ins and outs. They know what they're looking to do. They know what they did. And they, they just know, they, they know their project. So why don't, why don't we get them to talk about their project? Obviously, you know, that, that obviously then ignores, you know, the architect critic and stuff like that, but I'm not a, I'm not a critic. I don't claim to be a critic. The channel isn't a critique on architecture, despite the comment section. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, I'm not there to push my view and my thoughts and my critique on architecture. Yeah. I'm there to put the architect's work front and centre. But more and all, but more so, more importantly, I'm also trying to put the architect's face literally front and centre um, because I feel like architecture can be a very faceless industry and architects, the architect and client relationship is so vital so important and i am personally of the belief that architects should put their face out there more often instead of just relying on the work put out their personality their face their their voice um as a way to connect and um connect and communicate with the general public or their potential clients or whoever it may be Mm. and that's sort of what i try to do with my videos is let the architect communicate let the architect put their face to it um and let the architect tell tell the story of the project, not me. Like, yes, I have the questions that help get the architect's brain churning, churning but really it's just letting them take control of the narrative and then I just edit together a four, yeah. five-minute video. Yeah. 
that yeah, kind of it, encapsulates everything. You're basically anonymous in your videos. Like you're not present in. Mm, any of there's the a couple videos videos where I've been a little present. There was actually one where um, it was with Topology Studio at their South Melbourne beach home, beach yep. house. And I was in a few shots because um, I thought it'd just be a bit of fun if I was like the guest of the home. Yeah, yeah. And then one of the comments was like, who's that guy walking around the house? And I was like, <laughs> that's me. Yeah. yeah and then but yeah, I try, to, I, try to keep, I try to keep off this idea of being a host or, a, or the face um, You're not the Kevin McLeod of your. I'm not the your... Kevin McLeod. I'm not the. Um, oh man, Peter, someone. Shit. Crap. What's that <laughs> name? I don't know. I was watching it just the other day. Uh, what, the Australian Grand Designs guy? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Right. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. So, that, so that's interesting. So that's. I agree with you that architects need to be, you know that FaceTime, that personal storytelling, that just hearing their voice is really important, right? But um, mm. it's it almost takes somebody like you to come along and say, do you want to be in a video before architects tend to be able to generate that kind of stuff or they feel that way anyway. Um, mm. why, why do you think, you know, how do you, do you sort of, do you imagine a scenario where the broader industry, maybe people start making their own videos, maybe they start launching their own accounts do you think it works that way or how do you sort of see it working are there more channels like yours just with different focuses and that's a way that we could have more architects in videos and stuff like that how, how are we doing this Anthony what are we going to do to get more architects on tape that's a really good question how I reckon I guess there's a couple ways to sort of <clears throat> get the architecture industry out there whether that's you know we'll just use youtube as the example and platform yeah um there is the opportunity for architects to start their own youtube channel um so many youtube channels just started off with someone sitting in their bedroom with a phone recording themselves talking about a topic they were passionate about and then over time they were meant they were able to build build an audience around that and you know, they then started to upgrade equipment and blah, 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 blah. But yeah. so many just started off very basic with a phone and really that's about it. And a phone and an idea. And there's really no reason why an architect can't pick up their iPhone or Samsung or whatever f mobile phone they've got. And when they're, you know, whether when they're at the end of a job or even during construction, even just you know, record a few, just record a few in horizontal, in landscape, mm. none of this portrait crap, just record a few, you know, a few shots, you know, keep it, keep it nice and smooth, you know, like no need to be doing sort of this, <laughs> um, just record, just record the home and then, you know, grab a really cheap um, microphone that's good for a phone. Um, I think Rode has one for like $70. Yeah. And then sort of just record a little bit of a voiceover and use a editing app on on your phone and then splice it together and then upload it to YouTube. Um, now, you probably won't go viral instantly, or you probably it'll probably take years to gain any any form of traction. But you do, but you but you kind of just need to start somewhere. And, and if that's something you want to do, if that's something you want to communicate as a practice, your work, your ideas, your philosophies, your approach. Um, then YouTube is a great platform to get those ideas out because people, people on YouTube, like I said earlier, they they sit down to consume content. They're not just scrolling past on Instagram. Um, <clears throat> to give you sort of a quick back end idea, I think my Instagram TV videos get, I think one one or two percent of the entire video gets viewed. So, or Actually, I don't know, or maybe like one or two percent of the entire views watch the whole thing. But anyway, yeah. the point is like because it's so scrolling, people can just easily go past that content, and you can go into all this effort to create a video, and it might look like on paper you've got ten thousand views, but really, yeah, ten thousand people watched three, ten seconds, three plus seconds of your yeah. of your video, yeah. So when it comes to sort of like an architect trying to figure out YouTube, it's kind of like, it doesn't have to be like a 15 minute video. It can be four minutes, five minutes, two minutes, whatever it may be. But the, I guess the main thing there is you just need to 
have an idea of what you want to communicate, whether it is a home or an idea or um, even if it's just a detail that's really special for a project, um, there is opportunities for architects to pick up their phone and um, start uploading. Um, where I'm still a little bit unsure is saying <clears throat> an architect getting a video production company in to do that for them. Yeah. Um, I don't think the ROI is there yet yeah. for an architect. Um, but if, if you don't mind the graduate or even yourself or somebody sort of just taking a few shots, splicing it together, you don't even have to throw a voiceover, I guess. It's entirely up to you how you but want to do it. voiceovers can be very nice though. Yeah, Challenge, and we'll talk about generating those kind of where does that script begin and not that there's a script necessarily, but in terms of th concentrating on that message of what you want to communicate. But I just want to quickly go back and just before I forget, ask, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, what would your editing app of choice be for the iPhone? Because that's an interesting idea, actually editing the video on the iPhone. Is there anything that you, I mean, that's, you're probably not editing a bunch of videos on the iPhone, but is there anything out there that you just, they should just basically have a look, right? Is that... I have no idea how to edit on an iPhone. <laughs> I've had a few people ask me like, oh, what, what app should I download? I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. I pay <clears throat> absurd amount of money per month for Adobe Premiere yeah. or the Adobe Suite. So well, Then every architect probably already has that, but they don't necessarily want to be using yeah. Premiere, right? I mean, Yeah, Premiere is a bit of a, a, bit tough has a, bit of a learning, curve, learning curve. But um, yeah. I, I would just t Google, uh, not Google, go into the app store and just type in, video editor and i'm sure hundreds if not thousands will pop up and just pick a free one although just be careful the free ones probably will have a watermark on it or yeah. some, some something, something like dodgy going on yeah. yeah yeah so just pay the five bucks yeah. um come on you're architects yeah, yeah you got all the stuff you load it yeah <laughs> five bucks you can that's a coffee go without a coffee today. yeah exactly um, just um yeah honestly yeah i don't i don't i have no idea what um Video, uh, no, that's editing. fine. That's fine. I just wanted to check and see if there was anything that you kind of like had come no. across that looked good. But um, I've been getting a lot of ads on TikTok for Splice. Me too. I was going to say, but do I really want to mention something I saw in an ad? But yeah, I've been yeah. getting a lot of TikTok ads for Splice. That's funny that we're yeah. getting TikTok ads. Anyway, um, so but okay, so they're sitting. I know it's I, it's probably you know. I don't, I don't know if you like breaking down these kind of technical sort of advice around how you would go about making these videos, but but that is the direction that you're kind of suggesting people head is just like kind of have a crack at it, right? And and think of, and work on some of these shorter videos. Um, your advice about just taking some shots, like separating the narrative and the speaking from the filming and kind of doing those as two separate parts is really good advice. Now, you're good at asking questions to architects in the form of the interview that gets them telling the story of that project. But if you gave them a microphone and said, tell them, tell the story of this project, do you think like they might naturally struggle to do that? Although during lockdown, mm -hmm. I did see that you actually did give an architect your equipment and say, send me back a video, which is an amazing <laughs> accomplishment. And they created a wonderful video just talking to the camera. But you generally like sort of elicit these stories out of the client uh sorry out of the architect so if you were doing this video on your own you're probably sitting there with a bit of a blank page in front of you going well of the of the many things i could talk about what should i talk about what should i sort of put in the video as a beginner you're naturally sort of quite concerned about getting that right um mm. are there any tips that you would give in terms of maybe some some e some simple things that they could focus on just to get them through the first couple of videos yeah, my biggest tip would be to Google um, architectural storytelling, Bowerbird. So oh, that's a good tip. Bowerbird put out, I don't know actually how you find it exactly, but they put out <laughs> this really great, almost like a recipe on how to tell an architecture, an architectural story. Um, I'm going to paraphrase because there's no way I'll be able to quote it word for word and stuff like that. But basically you want to, you kind of, let's say it's, um, hypothetically speaking, it's a project that's been completed and you kind of want to do this little walkthrough to a video of this completed home. Yeah. So what you kind of want to do is focus on, I try to focus on a couple key areas. So what was the brief? Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to the brief, there's kind of two ways you can look at it. You can look at it from a room perspective. So the client wanted three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 
kitchen, living, dining, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And that's pragmatic and good, but I think there's a really good opportunity for architects to communicate their their value when you turn that brief around into what problems did the client come to you with? And, you know, whether that's a lack of nat- natural light or maybe that is, um, you know, maybe it is a lack of space for for the growing family or whatever it may be. But for the most part, and a lot of architects get this out of the clients in the early days is, you know, what problems do you have with your current home, and, you know, in terms of a renovation or extension? Yeah. Or even just a new home yeah. even. Mm-hmm. Um, so the whole pro the whole design process is the architect solving those problems of the client. So what was the brief? What problems did they come to you with? How did you solve those problems? So that's basically just talking about what did you design? And then and then you kind of want to talk about personally, you kind of want to then touch on um this isn't in any order but you know who the clients are you know sort of like a who what yeah um you can even sort of talk about where the project is and talk about the site and the context um yeah and then you sort of talk about the why and this is sort of being something that because i often will go to my youtube community and be like what do you want to hear from the architects like what what are you curious to know about with these projects and a lot of comments are like why did the architect do this? Why did the architect choose plywood? Why did the architect put the room over there? So <clears throat> what you want to do is for a lot of key decisions that you made, dive a little bit deeper into your mind and go, why did I do mm. that? Communicate that. So why, like, I think the problem, not a problem, but for many architects and those in the industry, we just know why you put certain rooms where you do and why you use certain materials but the youtube audience the youtube community or even just the general public they don't have that intimate knowledge um so it's your job as the architect to communicate that to them and walking around with your phone and being like you know we put the kitchen here to have a much better connection with the outdoor area for example that's that then gets the clients um that gets the audience thinking if that can apply to them, if that's something they want, if that's, um, but they can also then of course see the benefit of that. And, you know, it becomes as when you can talk about why you did things, people will begin to probably be a less, less critique as well, because a lot of the reason is, especially in architecture school, when you're doing studio and that, if you can give a reason why you did, if you can present why you did this, that leaves less chance for the criti- um, the critics at the end to question you on that because you've already communicated that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, start, you know, if you want to kind of storyboard it, you know, who are the clients? Or well, maybe start with where, where where's the project? What's the con- context? Yep. Who are the clients? Mm-hmm. What was the brief? You know, what were the challenges of, of the project? Um, what did you design? How did you overcome those challenges in the brief? Yep. Um, and why and why did you do it? And then yeah. if you touch on materiality and spatial layout, then that gives a nice overall story that you can start to um, communicate across through the through the video. That's, so th- those are the main that's, questions. That's that perfect, ask. man. I think that's such a good framework for. I could I could I think almost any architect could definitely map out their project through that framework. That's awesome. Um, did you? Yeah obviously the bowbird stuff they they have put out a lot of great resources on storytelling and their podcast and their blog posts and different things have been great and i've mentioned them a lot of a lot of times on my blog and different interviews that we've done and stuff um but do you think that your thinking around that was also informed by your publication when you were doing more writing and publishing on the designer motive is it more is instagram and how you developed captions sort of something that helped lead up to that or is it just something that you've kind of felt for a while and as a as a method for kind of storytelling around architecture um i actually didn't do a lot so probably going back to one of your very first questions was you know why did why did i start the youtube channel yeah i suck at writing like i hate writing and 
when it was Architecture Victoria back in the day, I tried writing, um, you know, editorial feature articles, stuff. yeah, editorial articles, yeah. and I really struggled with it. I really didn't, I really didn't enjoy the process. It was riddled with grammar um, errors and everything. Like yeah, that. yeah, something I, I didn't enjoy, and so I guess for me, the you like much easier for me to stick a camera in an architect's face and get them to say it and then i'll just <laughs> cut it all up but so you know it wasn't necessarily say the website publication or the <clears throat> instagram that informed these questions i think it was more it was actually the videos because what i find is what i found over the course of the last two years let's just say to round it up when I go to, when I record an interview and I go in with, you know, some set questions and whatnot, when I go to sit down and edit, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I probably should have asked them about this. I probably should have asked, asked them about that and this and that. And so I take that with me to the next video. But then at the same time, every home is a bit different. Mm. So, um, but it's just through that experience and through that just continually producing videos as you start to figure out what, you know, you have your base, your base questions, but then, you know, you, you really want to also just let the architect talk and, and, and let them rabble on. Yeah. But there becomes a point where <clears throat> um, it's, I guess a previous video starts to inform the next video in terms of the questions. And sometimes I get it right. And sometimes you rock up there with 10 questions and, you know, you're sitting down there with the architect for an hour and a half and you're like, crap, I've got to edit this down to four minutes. This will be fun. But then you've got, it's full of all this amazing knowledge and story and um, information, but you then got events because I, because that's what happened. I ended up, starting off with just a couple questions and then really started to ask a lot of questions. And then that became way too much. And then, I've, you know, so it's really just been about communicating with my um, audience. So, you know, what do you want to hear? Yep. Um, what have I learned from previous videos? Um, but what's, what is special about this home that I want to get out of the architect as well? Yeah. So yeah, Instagram and writing did not, sort of influence sort of the questions and all that just bellbird listen, um watching other oh, yeah. um shout out to never too small they do great yep. succinct um youtube videos um yep. and they really work well at getting the story across um touching on some of the key key aspects of the home materiality layouts um story background and stuff like that so yeah do you, yeah do sort you, of those that's really helpful. Do you, do you think that, because uh, there, are, there are some architects that are putting out videos on YouTube. Um, I think, you know, 30 by 40 workshop and stuff is probably a really good high production value example of that. Uh, but it can be easy for sometimes when architects start using social media or new media quite well, they end up attracting a really big crowd of architecture students and their channel or their platform ends up becoming let me mentor you on how to be an architect um, as somebody who f f and their target audience kind of morphs into people that are becoming architects. And I, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, do you think that, a, do you think that if, a, if an architect decided to build their own YouTube channel that they can in account be both potential client facing and sort of industry facing, or should they kind of endeavor as you have to sort of just stick to the guns and go, I'm going to make this potential client facing general public facing, and I'm not going to make this about why I chose Archicad over Revit. Like it's not going to become like an industry thing. Like, do you mm. think that that's something that, you know, assuming that an account gets some viewership, they kind of yeah. need to be mindful for, because I love what you're saying about taking inspiration and questions and all of that stuff from your community and letting them actually help you generate ideas for content. But if all they're asking is, Hey, I'm starting architecture next year. Do you have any advice for a student? Like, should should we kind of try to avoid that stuff? What do you think about that that issue? Yeah, um, I guess the difference between me and an architect mm. doing YouTube is, you know, I'm a media publication. I'm attracting 
Well, I guess we're kind of attracting the same audience. Like I want to get your work in front of the general public. That's my goal. In saying that, I did have a, um, I think I only did like two or three episodes of it, Architecture 101. And it was just because I found out I was sitting with architects. Why don't I get some, why don't we spend a couple Career advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Career advice. You know, what advice do you have for an architecture student? Um, But I stopped doing that because that's, I realized that I'm not wanting to target architecture students. That's nothing against architecture students. Yeah. I love you guys. I even manage an architecture student Facebook group. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. We've yeah. got a lot of love for us. But what I ended up finding was if if an architect puts out a video that's client focused, you know, it's gen- it's aimed for the general public, it's aimed for them to get a new client, mm. they're going to attract industry people because architects and students and graduates and everyone we're just we just gravitate to that content anyway we're so passionate not- about it that we do it for a career <laughs> so we're going to be the first yeah, people to well, turn up and watch it and leave a comment and all that stuff yeah yeah so you know if um you know if an architect starts putting out walkthrough videos of projects they completed that's you know they're communicating all the benefits of having them as the architect and blah 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 students will still find that incredibly useful because they can they can start to see and hear how an architect thinks and they can probably apply those <clears throat> broad ideas into their own design studios. Mm-hmm. Um, graduates can can also find that beneficial because, you know, same deal, they can learn from, from that architect without the architect going, okay, graduates and students, sit down and let me take you through this house. Yeah. Like the industry is just just naturally gravitates towards content, whether it's to architecture content, whether it's made for the industry or whether it's made for public facing. Like, I don't know why, I guess you just can't get enough of it. But, you know, I I think of an architect in saying that as well, I think, and and you as a marketing person will know this, is if you're going to start making YouTube videos, I guess you kind of need to think about who you want to target and why you want to target them. Cause you know, you might find you do want to target students and graduates because you do want to take on a mentoring type of position yep. or maybe you do want to use it to get clients or maybe you just want to build brand exposure for your practice or maybe you want to try and land um, lecturing roles or whatever it may be. Mm. And you obviously cater your content towards that, but um you know if you are going to be um i think really the best way is to kind of use it as a way to communicate the value of you as an architect and then whoever gravitates towards that will gravitate towards that yeah Uh, that's really 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 interesting we might come back to the youtube stuff but i also wanted to ask you a little bit about instagram as well because i i can imagine that you know, you mentioned earlier when I was kind of asking you sort of, have you sort of unlocked what lead, what the factors are that lead to a YouTube video being successful? And you were kind of answering like, well, you know, it's a bit of a work in progress, kind of, kind of still piecing it together. Um, as far as the algorithm goes, I imagine that your insights into the algorithm on Instagram and what tends to break through and what doesn't is maybe a little bit more fine tuned. Would you agree? Like, do you think at this no. point, no, it's still a massive mystery. It's like, I, okay. <laughs> like absolutely no <clears throat> negativeness to. Do you hate Instagram architect. right now? Oh no, <laughs> go on. No, no, no. To the, to the architect. I put out a, I put up a post, a project of an architect in Sydney. Um, I don't want to try pronouncing their practice name in case I get it completely yeah. wrong yeah um and you know i saw it as a it, it was a good project it was a good project it had i tend to use carousels and the first image was this great little photo of the of the kid sort of on this seat yep bookshelf type of thing underneath um some stairs mm-hmm. and i was like oh yeah this looks kind of cool um i think a few people will like it it ended up being my most liked post ever um it got over a million impressions. It got 2,000 odd likes and stuff like that. Like it just went bonkers. Yeah. And I was like, I have what? And then 
wanting to exploit the Instagram algorithm at the end of the year, you know, you did the, I did the top five posts on Instagram. Yeah. Um, that was obviously number one. And it just went crazy again. And I was yeah. like, okay, people, people like that. But then you put up this, then you put up a post that you think is going to do really well because the photography is really great. The architecture is obviously beautiful and, you know, it sort of gets average and you're like, oh, okay, then fine. Yeah whatever i don't understand how this works like i don't know you kind of think you know what you what people like and what people will gravitate towards but yeah like i've i've experimented with all these different type of hashtags and posting times and what is the cover image and all this stuff and yeah it's it's really hard to i try to just put it up and if people like it, they like it. And if they don't like it, yep. I guess they don't like it, but it, them not liking it, pressing the like button doesn't then translate that it's a bad project yep. either. It, it could yep. be a variety of algorithm things or, you know, just, yeah, something, knows. something's going on. This seems to be a common thread between the Instagram account and the YouTube account in that like the, the pivotal tipping point has been, maybe not to the same degree it's been a tipping point on Instagram. Maybe on Instagram it's more of a series of tipping points, but these images that they outperform, they go viral to to a degree um, hmm. and they lead to a massive little period of growth, right, where the account grows a lot, tons of reach, lots of new followers. And it seems that your strategy, your social media strategy, if we include YouTube in that, is be super stubborn and persistent and patient <laughs> And just keep yeah. putting out things and then occasionally something gets goes viral and then mm. that takes you up to a new level you kind of feel fr it's fr it's a frustrating level because you feel like you're in a bit of a plateau and things are just kind of average then something does really well again and then you you advance up to the next level is that like a is that sort have of you been, accurate have you seen like my graphs lately or what because that's really accurate to my instagram account <laughs> well, so that's, I, that's just I my started, that's my experience started, of social media in general. That it's like frustrating plateau, average, 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 mm -hmm. outperforming post, outperforming video, up to a new level. Repeat the process, and you just keep on. You know, the average is now higher. Like I think that's what's yeah. also remarkable about your YouTube account is that you know you had thirty something videos, forty videos, fifty videos until that winter video. Winter video gets eight hundred thousand views. Now you look at all the preceding videos that came before it. Now they've all got two hundred thousand views, two hundred fifty thousand views, um, hmm. or a lot of them do anyway. So it's it's kind of this one big powerful piece of content comes along, and it it's a tide that lifts all the boats, and all your posts start to do a little bit better. Is is that so? That is kind of your experience on your account, and is that kind of what you've yeah. observed? Yeah. So I started <clears throat> I started Instagram the account back in like 2015. Yeah. So, you know, it's five and a half years or so. Mm. Um, and it's sort of, it's sort of been a slow, slow sort of rise, but with, you know, some spikes. And I remember at the start of 20, was it 2019? I think it was 20 at the start of 2019. I don't know what was in Instagram's algorithm, but at the start of the year, I was just posting projects um, and they were getting a lot of likes, brought in a lot of followers. And then by June, everything just plateaued, as mm -hmm. you said. And then I think it was like halfway through 2020, it, the sort of same thing happened again. The, a lot of the posts were getting you know well above average likes and a more influx of followers and then it plateaued again. And then obviously cheated the algorithm a bit and posted all the most liked photos at the end. And then that's for another bit of a spike, another bit of a boost. Um, and now it's plateaued again. So it's, I think kind of what you said just before was <clears throat> I view Instagram and social media and YouTube and all that stuff as, as a long game. Like I'm not here to, if you're going to sign up to, you know, YouTube and, hope that within a month you're going to put out a video and it's going to go viral and you're going to get in the YouTube partner program and you're going to make hundred thousand dollars from ads and all that stuff. Like, you know, you're obviously kidding yourself. Like, you know, you need to just show up, same with Instagram, show up, put out content. And then over time, it's going to, the average is going to grow and, and there will be spikes. And when that spike happens, you will have a, have a new normal, but you can't rely on the spike 
Like you got to you got to almost think that a spike, a viral post or a viral video is just not going to happen, and it's just going to be slow and steady growth until it becomes useful for you as a practice or uh, or a business. Mm. Do you think that Instagram has years of good times left for it in terms of maybe differentiating like the the two camps? There's you as the kind of the publisher, the media platform, Mm -hmm. the content sharer or or aggregator, and then there's the individual practices. Um, Do you think that uh, what what sort of, what do you think the atmosphere on Instagram is like at the moment um, as a platform and how do you sort of see it going over the next couple of years? Do you have any predictions? I I don't have any predictions, but <clears throat> I'm really interested on how I think they're sort of trialing it for US content creators, but I'm really curious as to how Instagram could pay creators, much like YouTube pays creators, whether it is through a five-second ad at the start of an IGTV video or um Oh, really, I think that's really the only way you could possibly monetize it from a creator point of view. But, you know, Instagram has evolved a lot since I first started with it. You know, obviously now with IGTV and reels and stories and there's a new feature called guides and, you know, like obviously the chroni- chronicle algor- um, yeah. home feed caused a bit of a stir when that got changed up and... Um, there, I just don't see a viable competitor coming in anytime soon to sort of make people move from Instagram to their platform, no matter what they tell you in their Twitter bio. Mm. And I feel like Instagram is still good for what it is. And that's, you know, if for an architect or, or a publisher, it's a great way to put out beautiful imagery. It's a great way to communicate your projects is a great way to communicate your practice. Um, and there's a, there's an audience there. Like they've got billions of users or, you know, mil- hundred millions, hundreds of millions of users yeah. and all that stuff. They've got all the big numbers. Um, I feel like if there's going to be a downfall of Instagram, it's going to be because they've, they've put in the wrong feature or they've took a misstep on what they thought the Instagram community wanted, Mm. Um, you know, especially being acquired by Facebook, whenever that happened, um, you know, they've become this huge company, but sometimes that can also cause a lot of disconnect with your users. So providing that they don't do anything overly stupid and stuff, like I think Instagram is still a very, if an architect came to me and went, where should I invest my time? Should I put it in Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Reddit? Um, I'll, I'll 100% just go Instagram every day of the week. Yeah. It has a very it has a very strong, a very popular home and architecture community around it. it has a lot of content that wants to be consumed and that gets consumed on a daily basis in that in in that genre so um yeah i think yeah instagram they can slow up on the new features they don't need to put a new feature out every six months but um yeah i think i think that's still the go-to platform and will remain the go-to platform for architects for quite some time right okay so you're not sort of you're not in the middle of uh you know, planning out your succession plan from Instagram to TikTok. Like, mm-hmm. let's see, we have, this platform's going nowhere. Let's, you know, get the life yeah, right. No, like, you're, you're still I, committed to Instagram for the design. Yeah, mode. so much so that I've, I've started only putting, I started putting full length videos on Instagram because I'm sure anyone that uses Instagram can probably attest to this, that it can be a real pain in the ass to go off the platform yeah. to look at a link or watch a full video or whatever it may be. Yeah. So Instagram has its own little bubble. And so I treat it like its own little bubble. Yeah. And, you know, I'll put the full video there and, you know, it, it's its own little sort of strategy. And then I've sort of, you know, treat YouTube as its own and the website and 
you know, I post up a couple of TikToks here and there and don't worry, it's not me me dancing. So <laughs> you can watch it. It's all good. Um, but it's one of those, it's one of those things where I don't, <clears throat> I don't see me not using Instagram. How I use Instagram might evolve over time. Um, but I think that will continue for at least the next three years to be a platform that I will just put a lot of focus and attention to. Um, YouTube obviously being probably the one I will put more focus to, but I won't be diverting time from Instagram to TikTok. Yeah. Because it just doesn't, I, I can't, I can't see another viable platform for an architecture publication to replace Instagram with at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Interested to just quickly get your thoughts on the audience for architecture in general. Um, you know, when I've spoken to or, or done episodes with um, Nick or Ben from Bowbird or anytime I talk to anybody in the media, we're, there's always this feeling that we're just kind of starting to just scratch the surface of how much unmet interest there potentially is in good architecture content. Um, mm. There's always the sense that the future is going to be, there's going to be so much more volume of quality content. Um, do you sort of, do you sort of feel like there might be, maybe there's, do you think there's the demand side has room to grow? Um, do you, like, how do you, how do you sort of see, you know, the market uh, for consuming architecture content? Do you, feel, do you, as somebody who's in it, do you find like it's kind of oversaturated or, or what are your impressions about, you know, that media landscape for architecture? Yeah. So <clears throat> when I was a student, I, on my personal account, I followed a ton of Instagram architecture publications. Um, yeah. What do, we, just quickly, just what do you, what do you mean by that? Like next top architects and stuff like that, Australian architecture. Yeah, stuff like that. So yeah, a publication that just is just on Instagram. They don't really have a website and all they do is they aggregate and curate content. Yeah. Probably from other um, similar accounts to theirs. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, I find those accounts to be quite, um, well, a lot of them are terrible because yeah. they don't credit properly and they probably don't get licensing and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But you know, they'll often, you know, you'll often see the same images on these platforms, on these public, on, on these accounts. And it's always the same type of photo. And it's, it's not always necessarily the architecture photo, uh, photograph, but it's like, real estate you know, super famous. Yeah. And, you know, they, and I used to follow those quite a lot. And just over time, I just started to unfollow them and instead just followed, you know, the design files and the local project and you know stuff like that because they've got good local quality content yeah um so i really think that i think there's a there, there will always be a demand for quality content now quality can be quite subjective and mm. lives on this huge spectrum you know like some people would argue that and they're well within their rights to say this even if it hurts my feelings the designer <laughs> motive probably isn't at the absolute highest quality compared to other accounts, other sure. publications, I would argue, I would say it's the highest, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I real, but when it comes to like the, I feel so just like the Instagram audience is just so vast. Like I, I, I don't know exact figures, but, you know, I assume that, you know, Dwell has millions of Instagram followers, Arc Daily, millions of followers, yep. Architectural Digest, millions of followers, like these huge platforms that have millions and millions of followers and, mm -hmm. um, you know, even the design files having close to half a million followers and all yeah. that, like, they're, and they're just continuing to grow at a crazy rates and, yeah, you know, not to not to brag, but I'm nearly at a hundred thousand. Like that's a crazy amount of numbers that, you know, nearly a hundred thousand people follow this account because they want to see, you know, homes and apartments and stuff like that. And you know, people follow Arc Daily for their content. And yeah, um, but then you'll see profiles that post a lot of content, but they don't get a lot of they don't have the 
audience. And I think, you know, there could be a magnitude of reasons for that, but it could be a sense of oversaturation. Like you don't need to follow, you know, a hundred or 200 um, architecture inclined Instagram accounts, because if you, because if you kind of just follow maybe 10, yeah, you're kind of yeah. going to get a good overview of what's happening in the world on architecture. Yeah. So if you're a publication and you're kind of thinking, how can I tap into this audience that obviously love architecture, home design, interior design, garden design, you know, home improvement and all that stuff, um, you know, I really feel as though you need to take a step back and think instead of trying to reach 5 million people, let's just try to reach a hundred thousand people, you know, let's, let's narrow it down to homes in Australia or narrow it down yeah. to more niche. Cafe. Right? Yeah. Niche down niche, mm. niche, whatever, yeah. wherever, wherever you, you are. Say. Yeah. yeah. Um, niche down, you're going to find an audience. You're not going to find a huge audience, but you know, if you try to reach everyone, you're not going to reach anyone. And when you try to reach only a few, there's a real solid audience there. And I think there's an audience on Instagram for all type of homes, you know, all, all types of architecture, even. Um, yeah. I say homes because I, that's obviously where that's I live in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, because I'm the first one to ever focus on homes. But, you know, it's it's been insane that, you know, I'm not the only one that focuses on homes. You've got Lunchbox Architect, the Design yep. Files, logo projects, honey, like all those Australian, Melbourne-based, or well, Sydney as well. Um, you know, we kind of live in the same sphere, but there's enough people to go around when, when it's good quality content, when it's consistent. And, you know, it's – and you kind of – do it in such a way that it's, you know, you're not you're not wasting the audience's time. Like you're not over posting. You're not over saturating your own feed effectively. Yeah. By yeah. posting, you know, twenty things a day. Yeah. So that's good advice for for publications. It's it, but it makes me think a little bit about the practices themselves. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, you no, know, but but just I guess a follow up question, which is that, you know, to actually. There's there's even more competition amongst firms, right? Because there's mm. for every publication, there's hundreds of firms that are actively posting on Instagram, and the yeah. the hierarchy of those firms, the the difference between the firm that's starting today and the one that has seventy five thousand followers is pretty significant. And it's not just like there's one firm out there like that that's drawing a crowd in that way. There's dozens or hundreds of firms that are out there, yeah. and so you know a small firm is facing a similar, similarly intimidating challenge in terms of, well, it can't just be turning up with good photos now, right? Like we need to actually, well, I mean, you might disagree because I think there's always room for good, good architecture, good photos and stuff like that, right? But, but do you think that maybe that, that idea of trying to think about how you're niching or differentiating with your Instagram account, is that something that, you know, when you're, because you look at so many accounts, Anthony, so you just get such a good idea of like, oh, you must just see an account and go, oh, they're going to struggle. <laughs> like, yeah. well, well, this account's going to be huge. And you, you've developed probably a quite a good gut instinct for that. So what, what are some of your general observations about, you know, um, really the sort of the state of the union for small, ambitious architecture firm Instagram accounts at the moment? All right. So I'm going to speak to an Australian context. because Yeah, please do. Important. Please do. Um, <clears throat> so I think to, to sort of begin with that, is one, if you are a small practice and you just started up your Instagram account, don't don't be like, don't be scared. Like that 75,000 followers account, mm. they started in the exact same spot you did. Mm -hmm. So to get to 75, you got to start at one and then you got to get your first follower. Then you got to get your second follower and so on and so forth until you get to 75,000. So but how do you get those 75,000 people to click that follow button? That's, that's the big question. <laughs> and really it, I, it's sort of a mixture. And this is sort of what I've been battling with personally on the designer motive and it will relate to yeah. practices yeah. is, you know, why would someone click follow on my account over 
another account? You know, why would they choose to follow me? Like why, why follow me and, and not just them effectively, hmm. you know, um, why follow the lunchbox architect Brody? Why follow him, but not follow me. And it really comes down to trying to have that point of difference. And on Instagram, it can be very difficult to have that point of difference, whether, you know, you can do things where you just continue to post up your professionally photographed um, homes and projects um, and just sort of post one or two a day, you know, one or two photos a day and just keep feeding the feed effectively. Just keep the rotation. Putting, yeah, just keep rotating. Yeah. If you just started, that's quite difficult. So, it is, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if we actually take a step back and you're a fresh practice, You've, you've just left your previous office, you started now, you've got no, you've got say one project you're designing and in construction, you know, how do you start to begin to grow an Instagram audience? And, you know, I think, I think one thing that's re that Instagram has the potential for with architects, which I don't feel like is being really utilized is almost using it as a way to document and share the construction process process of a home through not just one feature length grand design episode but through micro videos on instagram that's been you can even film that in portrait that's fine and yeah. you just sort of you know and then you know why would someone follow you because they want to see what happens with that house next yeah, exactly. you know you've just poured the slab okay what I want to see what the frame looks like. I want to see what the cladding looks like. I want to see the kitchen, the bathroom and all this stuff. So I think there's a really good opportunity for <clears throat> architects to communicate directly with the audience and, and whether that's in the comments or whether that's, you know, even just um, the captions and how you write the captions or whether it's um, even producing one minute videos for, for the Instagram feed or Instagram TV or whatever it may be, or reels. Um, you know, there's this, there's, I guess you gotta, you just gotta give people a reason to click and, and mm. putting out good photos isn't always enough. And that's what yeah. I realized is, you know, me posting the same project that so many other publications are posted yeah. isn't enough for someone to follow me. Yeah. So how can how can I be different from Brody's publication? And the way that I can be different, Brody's a great writer, so he obviously has really great articles. So that's yeah. why people flock to his website. Yeah. I can't write great articles, I can make videos. So that's why people and I post those videos on Instagram. And that's why people, I hope, partially follow me on Instagram is because of that original content they can't get anywhere else. And if you can do something with your account that's quite unique or original that goes beyond just posting black and white site photos and um <laughs> hopefully i haven't triggered anyone in your audience because i <laughs> well i don't I see that one as much these days black and white site photos jeez that's from um, 2017 but yeah yeah i know i know exactly yeah. what you're talking about and it, it's interesting because even your example of going well it's hard to innovate in the photo format. So let's immediately start thinking short video, like maybe in the mm. feed, maybe in IGTV, like because already, you know, you pull up the top 30 architecture firms in Australia or America or the UK on Instagram, you'll be lucky well, to find that list. Yeah, I've got, I, keep, I keep that list just, I yeah, I'll post in the notes, but you yeah. look down their accounts, you'll just see they're all basically doing the same thing as each other. Um, yeah. Continuing to explore the same patterns and processes that they originated five years ago when they all started their accounts you know they're still they're still doing what they did then to a certain degree um and you're going right but maybe we can use some of the other features or maybe we could just take a bit of a different approach and you could look down that list and, and you'll you be guaranteed that they won't be doing that like you could look at any of those yeah. top accounts they will not be posting short videos um explaining breaking down some of the decision making process behind did we use plywood why did we put the kitchen over here you're not going to see that from them so that's that's where that differentiation starts to work right yeah and i think and you know like and when they've gone when these accounts have reached the you know upper echelon of followers yeah they don't necessarily 
because whatever they're doing is working. So they don't need to try and innovate. They don't have to they do much at all, to. really. <laughs> yeah. so they just need to keep doing what they're and doing. Keep getting recommended working. to everybody to follow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, you know, Instagram, none of this is confirmed information, of course, because yeah. they keep it quite secret. But when Instagram releases a new feature like Reels, mm. they want people to use it. So they're going to push that into people's feeds and they're going to prioritize accounts that use these new features. So I think one of my reels with um, DKO and Slab Architecture, that's got 188,000 views. Wow. And, you know, I posted two from Ben's, which was literally me actually handhold just moving it around and slapping on one of their music things on it. And that's got, I think one's got like 50,000 and another one's got 30,000 views and they yeah. brought in quite a lot of interest and followers and stuff like that. So if you're an, if you're an architecture practice starting today on Instagram, look at reels and look at IGT because those would sort of be the features that you've Instagram the, are going to be looking yeah, to push. You've got the best. And they're going to prioritize those. You've got a much better shot of the algorithm helping you out there in those yeah. areas. Yeah. And then and then yeah. really the, the other thing is if if you do have a project that you've completed and you got it photographed, send it to all these Instagram accounts and be like, hey, can you share it? And if they ask for money, tell them to piss off. You're not going to give them money for it. <laughs> or pay them. Stupid. Just pay them. <laughs> no, no, don't pay them. Don't pay them. It's not much. Just pay them. No, don't do it. Um, I don't I, like But that. that's interesting um, that you said send it off to a bunch of, you know, because the a lot of the rationale um, out there still is, and I'm not going to criticize it necessarily, but it's... Um, my project is ready. Which magazine should I put it in? Mm. And it's always yeah. about it's a it's a media strategy of one. It's the one magazine, and then yeah. the opposite yeah, of the spectrum yeah. would they, be they DM a hundred Instagram accounts that each have a accumulated follower base of you know one hundred and fifty million followers. Like yeah, very very different strategies. But that's not to say that the magazine routes is bad. I'm not uh, hating, magazines. I'm not hating, I'm not hating on the yeah. magazines. Yeah. Mm. Because, you know, I've often come across this headache where it's like I see their project and I, I want to share it and I can't because the magazine's got ex exclusivity for the next yep. two months. And I'm like, ugh, come on. But once, if you feel like your project can get into a magazine, that's great. It's a great way to show off to clients. They, I don't know, magazines, demographics, because I don't buy them, but... <laughs> You know, there's still there's still a good mm. reason to get into a magazine. But if you're a new practice, it's your first project, and a magazine wants six months. They're going to put you in it June's might, yeah. issue, six months down the track, and then they want exclusivity for a month after that. Can you afford, as a practice, to go seven months with only one um, one exposure? opportunity through this magazine so my biggest recommendation if you're a new practice with a new project don't try and get it in a magazine i would get it on on i mean i'm not using this to promote bowbird but they're a great platform to get it out to so many different publications so what you want to do is you want to just push it out whether you dm 100 instagram accounts your email all the top um, architecture blogs, whether, you know, Arc Daily and Dezine and, you know, all those top hitters and yep. then the second tier people. and yep. But you don't want to sort of be beholden to an exclusivity from a magazine if that's your very first project <clears throat> and you're trying to get your work out there. Yep. And so Instagram is a really good way to, you know, whether whether legally it's the right way to do it, but, you know, if you post up a few photos, you give it to a few few dozen instagram accounts they post it other instagram accounts are going to pick it up yeah they're going to lift it off those accounts yeah repost sure. it hopefully with credits but you never know yeah um and then it's just going to sort of grow from there yeah um and that's going to get you in front of so many more eyeballs than a magazine issue will probably ever do yeah, yeah. um it's the better long-term play I've, I've sorry i've i've seen it work so well as well. Like the exact example you're kind of hypothetically putting together, I've seen it happen in practice. Um, brand new firm, one project photographed. Their choice was, you know, wait eight months to be in, you know, a magazine or 
just push it out there um, to lots of different publications online on social media. They created their Instagram account from scratch, put nine photos from the project on their feed. And I think within a month after it getting published in all these different places, they'd cracked like three, 4,000 followers, you know, and that's, then amazing. that's a base that then they can build on as a brand. <clears throat> Whereas I think, I think back and go, what would have happened if they would have gone in the magazine? Like they could have ended up doing the media stuff as well. So I, I guess it's not, hmm. you know, it's not exclusive in a sense of you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, I suppose with the, with the magazine strategy. But, but what you're talking about is the delay, right? That those yeah. oftentimes that time delay that can be involved yeah and you know if if you're so desperate on wanting to be in a magazine your second project maybe you're in a better position then to look to get that into a magazine but if you've if you've just got the one project to your name yeah you're much you're much better trying to get it <clears throat> out there as soon as possible i would even argue don't even wait for the landscape to settle in get oh that's a class you must hear that all the time right we're just gonna wait oh, yeah, six yeah. months because the landscape and yeah i think i've got like six six shoots that i'm waiting for the landscape to settle in on <laughs> you know i get it the landscape makes a big difference but if again if you're a <clears throat> if you're a young practice and this is your first project and you need that to market your practice yeah you can't really wait six months 12 months mm. for the landscape to grow mm. you, you kind of just you know even if you just get you, you get a young and up-and-coming architecture photogra photographer, they get a few interior shots and a couple exterior shots, yep. and you do that, and you just push that out. And then maybe in 12 months, once you land a, another project or another two projects, then maybe you get the the you know the Peter Bennett's, the Tatiana Plitz or Shannon McGrath's to mm. re-photograph it with the landscape in, mm. and then, you know. It's a whole new thing. You know, yeah, you, you know, get, it's you almost two, like a revisit. Yeah, exactly. You get kind of two bites at the at the pie doing it that way as well to a certain degree. Obviously, there's there can be a lot of logistical issues with that, with yeah. clients and, and, <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. But yeah. Well, maybe you just do the exterior shots 12 months down the line once yeah. the landscape settles. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I don't know whether it's just the way that I've approached my my own sort of publication is I've always sort of been – in the let's do it and put it out you know let's not let's not sit on it let's not wait for it you know let's not um you know one thing i what you know could have been something i did was you know let's film 10 episodes of an architect's home and i'll wait until i filmed all 10 and then i'll start to publish those videos yeah. mm. but what i decided was you know what let's just film it and publish it and then we'll film the next one and then publish it whenever that is and then let's just yeah. You know, sort of just rock up the site, shoot, go home, edit, publish, and that's it. Yeah. Like I have this yeah. sense of immediacy to what I do that I just want to get it out there, whether it's perfect or it's, the videos aren't perfect, but I just it's all about just getting it out there because there's always going to be the next one. And yeah. that's the same with same with architects. Like there's always going to be, hopefully, the next project and you kind of just want to get it out there if you're the first if this is your first project just get it out there because you, you, there's going to be a next one that you can take a bit more of a slow approach but at the moment you just don't have that luxury of time hmm. and revenue to do that i agree with you so much on the immediacy I, th I feel the exact same way i actually don't feel comfortable until it's out there i only feel better once it's gone right do you feel the same way? Mm. It's like sitting on it. If you were to then go, oh, I'll just do this or wait, I'll wait a couple of months. Like that's, that just creates anxiety, doesn't it? Like you start to yeah. want to tweak yeah, it, like, want to change it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, for me, if maybe it's sort of built into you as an architecture student, not, not literally, but <laughs> you know, this idea of perfectionism that it has to be perfect, has to be perfect. But really like if i put out a video that i think is good good enough mm. it's great i like it mm. versus oh but it's not perfect you know I, I probably need to you know just shift shift the frame over that a little bit more or maybe i need to you know who knows what else but you know when you try to make a video perfect and it's like would you rather sit on it for three months and not get it out there not get that feedback loop i think that's really important 
mm. um, at least with what I'm doing, is the feedback loop is, but if I, if I sat on winter architectures video for six months, you know, who knows what would have happened. Um, yeah. And that could be the same with an architect's first project. If you sit, sit on the media strategy for six months, who knows what opportunities you're you miss. missing out on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because you kind of wanted to wait for the perfect moment. You wanted to wait for the perfect uh, magazine issue that best suits your project and, you know, all this stuff. But, you know, how many viral posts did you miss out on? How many followers hmm. haven't you gained because it's sitting on someone's desk or something like that. Again, not to hate on the magazine world because, no, you know, that's mean, like, Yeah, it makes sense. It, like their timelines yeah. are just practical around how long it takes to put together a magazine. Yeah. Like it's a lot of there's, work. There's no way they can just sort of grab a few projects, send it to the printer <laughs> and be done. Like a completely different industry. Yeah. Um, and that's the same with Instagram. It's a whole different platform. It's a whole different industry on its own. It's, it's a whole other different publication, mm. op, um, publication platform, you know, like – you know, I started out just as an Instagram account. There's so many others that are just Instagram. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, your website blogs and the and the YouTube channels and whatever it may be. But, um, yeah, I'm all about just, just get it out there. What it is, it is, it is what it is. And if, you know, just waiting, you know, tweaking it for the next six months probably won't make – that big of a difference from the eyes of those that are consuming it generally yeah no one's going to know <laughs> it's great advice anthony thanks we should probably wrap it up there um okay. can i have you back on again sometime to talk more about this stuff because we could go on for a long time i think and even talking about your general thoughts on getting over perfectionism <laughs> it would, would be a whole other episode but um thank yeah. you so much man hope, hope to do it again sometime no, well, good. No, it's good and um yeah architects don't be don't be scared of whipping your phone out and have a crack at youtube yeah. even if you don't get any it's worth just learning how to do it yep and do you have uh any anything or anything that you want to plug to architects to anybody else just the design emotive what's you know what do you want to what do you want from people right now um, if any architects are keen to jump in front of a camera, I knew it. <laughs> um, at the moment, it's only really Melbourne because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, if you, if you are keen to maybe tread the waters of video, cause it is quite new, yeah. um, you know, always keen to collaborate with, um, local architects. So yeah. Or if you're bored and want to watch a video, there's a YouTube channel. Go subscribe to the design emotive and yeah, if you've yeah, got an interesting that. project, get in touch with Anthony. Sweet. Awesome. Love it.